We start the session with a talk by Franz Bader on a joint paper with Deepak Kapoor, and the topic is deciding the word problem for ground identities with commutative and extensional symbols. Hey, thank you, Jürgen. Um, so this is a joint work with Deepak, uh, which we started when I visited him uh, in New Mexico in 2018, and we continued the work in 2019 when Deepak visited Tristan. So let me first explain what the word problem for ground identities is. It's a very old problem. Uh, so first of all, what are ground identities? Well, it's uh, equations between terms that contain no variables as usual. Um, so the word problem says, given a finite set of ground identities and two ground terms S and D, um, is S equal to T modulo this theory, where from a semantical point of view, we define this as usual in logic. So we see, say S equal T must hold in all models of E. It's well known that this problem is decidable in polynomial time. And one approach for showing this is actually congruence closure. So what is congruence closure? We can show that this relation equal E is the same as congruence closure of E where I get the congruence closure of E by starting with E and then closing it under reflexivity, symmetry, transitivity, and congruence. So the most important part of this is congruence, um, where we say if uh, S1 is equal to T1 and Sn is equal to Tn, and we have an NRE function symbol, then we could, can put this around the tuples and the resulting terms are again equivalent. Now, this is the most problematic rule here because uh, congruence can generate an infinite number of identities clearly. We can put more and more uh, function symbols around. However, what one can show is that it's actually sufficient to restrict congruence closure to the subterms of E, so the input identities, and the terms S and T for which we want to show that they are equivalent. This is a rather old result by actually three groups of authors in the same year. Now, you could ask, why am I interested in this old result? Um, well, my motivation actually comes from description logic. So where we look at a setting where we want to give names to composed objects. So let me illustrate this by an example. Say, I have two individuals, one called Jackie, the other called Jack. And they are spouses of each other. And now I would want to um, introduce a couple individual, which stands for the couple consisting of Jackie and Jack. Uh, here I wrote uh, the couple individual, so this name here as a ground term, applying the couple constructor to the constants Jackie and Jack. Why is this advantageous? Well, because assume we have another couple. So different individuals, Jacqueline and John. But now at some point we learn that Jackie is actually equal to Jacqueline and that Jack is equal to John. Uh, if we learn that and we have represented this couple by a ground term, then actually we automatically get the consequence that the couples are also equal and concurrence closure can show that. So we get this equality between the two couples uh, by applying concurrence closure. Now, if we had represented these couple just by new generic names for couples, then this consequence would not have been obtained. So if to this representation, we add the information that Jackie is equal to Jacqueline and Jack is equal to John, we would not be able to derive that these two couples are equal. So this was the motivation from description logic. Now, um, if we have couples, uh, then we could say, well, in the previous slide, we represented couples as an ordered uh, tuple. But in general, we could also say uh, the order in which we write the members of this couple is irrelevant. But then of course, uh, what we get is uh, commutativity of this couple operator. Yeah? And so now, we want to derive that actually couple of Jackie check is the same as couple of check and Jackie. 
in a more general setting, this means uh, I want to look at a setting where some binary function symbols in my signature are allowed to be commutative. And the subset of the signature that contains the commutative symbols I call sigma c. Now we want to look at equality modulo e and commutativity of the elements of sigma c. So I look at the identities that hold in all models of E together with commutativity. Now this relation can again be decided using congruence closure. I just now need to take commutative congruence closure. So the only difference is now that in addition to the other rules, I also have the commutativity rule. And here is what the commutativity rule says. So for all ground terms, I add uh, f of s t equal f of t s to my congruence closure. Now, again, uh, this is an infinite set, but one can see that one can again restrict to a set of polynomial size of relevant terms. Now, it's not just the subterms. It may contain some commutative permutations of them, but again, one can prove that a polynomial number uh, of terms are sufficient and we can restrict congruence closure to that. This was actually originally shown by Downey et al. in the 1980s paper. But for example, Deepak also gives a detailed uh, description of how to do this in a 2019 paper. So this is my motivation, first of all, why we would want to look at commutativity and also pointing out that how commutativity can ha be handled is actually no. Now, the new thing I want to introduce is what I call extensionality. So there we are back at ordered couples, so no commutativity. And what we want to say is, well, uh, if two couples are equal, this can only be the case if the components are also equal. Uh, so I have say, if couple of x, y is equal to couple of x prime, y prime, and these are now ordered couples, then x must be equal to x prime and y must be equal to y prime. So in our example with um, these two couples, so in the first example, I said, what is if we learn that uh, the components are equal? Now I look at a setting where we actually learn that the couples are equal. And if we have extensionality of this couple constructor, then we should be able to derive that in this setting, actually Jackie is equal to Jacqueline and Jack is equal to John. So in a general setting, what we want to do is we have another set of function symbols, uh, which I call Sigma E for extensional. At the moment, I assume that Sigma E and Sigma C are disjoint. I will come back to that point later um, and argue why this is an important restriction. So we have this additional signature. And now, what do I want to do? I want to look at <clears throat> equality modulo. Well, what we had before, namely E and commutativity, but also extensionality of the elements of sigma E. And I call a model which, which satisfies uh, this implication here, an extension model. So we can again do congruence closure. So now it's commutative congruence closure with extensionality. And what I add is the extensionality rule. Not just writing the implication from above as such an additional rule for congruence closure. I say, if um, I have derived uh, that this here is an element of the congruence closure, then I want to add uh, all the identities between the subterms to the congruence closure. The question is, uh, can I now uh, get decidability by some sort of restriction of the congruence closure to a finite or ideally polynomially large set of terms? And this question I asked myself for quite a while. I worked together with Barbara Moraska on trying to restrict congruence closure, but we didn't get a solution for that. Until I met Deepak and Deepak said, <clears throat> well, why don't you use a rewriting based approach? 
Um, so let's, before we start with the rewriting based approach, let me try to explain why extensionality is different from commutativity. So we have seen that the congruence rule can create large identities from small identities. So I have these two small identities. I can make it into a large one. <clears throat> In general, without extensionality, however, I cannot derive new small identities from the large ones because there's no rule there that, that goes down again into the subjects. But extensionality is exactly a rule that does that. So it's not clear why we couldn't go from small to large to small to large and so on. So it's not clear how we could bound uh, the terms. So it's far from obvious, but the rewriting based approach allows us that, uh, as I will show. So there were several approaches for the normal congruence closure to do it uh, using a rewriting based approach. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to uh, show you how we can extend Deepak's approach from 97 by commutativity and extensionality. So what's the general idea in a rewriting based approach? Well, we start, we want to find, so we start with our E and what we want to find is a canonical term rewriting system, R for E, such that uh, two terms are equivalent, meaning they belong to the congruence closure, if and only if they have the same canonical forms. First of all, canonical term rewriting system is as usual one that's terminating and confluent. What are canonical forms? Well, it's starting with a term F, its canonical form is the unique irreducible term that can be reached from this S by applying the rules in R. What we can show is that given E and these extensional symbols and the commutative symbols, we can compute a term rewriting system R that's canonical. And this system is such that we can also compute the canonical forms in polynomial time. Obviously, this gives us uh, one of our main theorems, namely that the commutative and extensional word problem for finite sets of ground identities is decidable in polynomial time. To make this more clear, what we can decide is given two ground terms, whether they are equal uh, with respect to E and the commutative symbols in sigma C and the extensional symbols in sigma E. And we can do that in polynomial time. So let me try to show um, how our algorithm works. So given E, the subterms of the terms occurring in E are again important. We also need the constants occurring in E. So what we do in our first step is we introduce new constants for the terms that are not constants. So for all the subterms of terms occurring in E, we introduce a new constant. In addition to make things uniform for a given constant, I will also denote it as CA. So if I have a constant A, if I write CA, I just mean A. Whereas for a term S with CS, it's one of the new constants. Next, I determine an arbitrary linear order on the constants. Uh, and now we have the constants in C0, the original ones and the new ones. It's totally irrelevant how I choose this order. It just must be a, a linear order. So all the constants must be comparable. Now I introduce rules for my rewrite system. And the first kind of rule encodes terms. So if I have a term S, which is F of S1 to Sn, then it gives me this rule. So F of Cs1 to Csn rewrites to Cs, the constant corresponding to S. In addition, I introduce rules that encode my identities in E. So if I have an identity S, equals t, I want to rewrite either cs into ct. 
I do that if CS is larger than CT and if it's the other way around, I take the other way. I will call rules of this form here, function rules and rules of this form, constant rules. Now remember, we want to find a canonical system, a terminating and confluent system. It's easy to see that the system I've just constructed is terminating, but in general, it's not confluent. So in the paper, there's an example showing that. So uh, since I have two kinds of rules and I want to make them confluent, I look at these kinds of rules and I first treat the constant rules. Now, basically for the constants, I look at the equalities between constants that are induced by the constant rules. This is an easy task, it's just reachability in a graph. Now, if I have an equivalence of constants, an equivalence class of constants, I choose the smallest element in there. So I say, let's see, I be the least element with respect to greater in this class. And then I rewrite all the other constants to CI. These are my new constant rules and I throw away the old ones. Now, how do I treat function rules? The first step is that, remember the function rules contain constant symbols and I first uh, rewrite them using these rules I just introduced. After that, I look at a left-hand side of a function rule and then I look at all the constants that can be derived from that left-hand side. I look, uh, locate the least one, say it's di. And then I introduce uh, the function rule, f of c1 to cn goes to di. I remove all the other function rules um, and replace them by constant rules, which say dj goes to di for i different from j. Now, if we only have, uh, so we don't have commutative and extensional symbols, then this is actually already the algorithm. Uh, but of course we have to iterate. If in this step I've introduced new constant rules, I have to go back to one and I iterate through that until no new constant rules have been added here. How do we treat commutativity? First of all, um, I'm adding to my system the infinite rewrite system that basically expresses uh, commutativity. To order these rules, I use a lexicographic path order, which uh, extends my order on constants and otherwise is done so that this is actually a total order on ground terms. It's well known that we can do that. Now this is an infinite system, but still I can rewrite modulo this system. So with respect to the system without really generating this, I just have to reorder uh, arguments of F. Now in the presence of commutative symbols, um, my rule that treats function rules must be changed a bit. So now I don't look at a left-hand side f of c1 to cn, but I say, let's look at rules that have left-hand side f of c1 to c2 or f of c2 c1. But again, I collect all these rules. I find the least constant. And then I do what I did before. So I replace these rules by this one rule going to the least constant and then the corresponding constant rules. So this was how to deal with commutativity. Extensionality requires us to add an additional step. Um, so how do we take care of extensionality? Um, so basically the other way around. So now we look at a situation where we have an extensional function symbol. And um, we assume that two rules rewrite into the same constant. Now extensionality says that then the corresponding arguments need to be equal. So this means if I have such a situation, 
I add uh, these equalities and I order them in my rewrite system according to my linear order on my constant symbols. Right. And so overall, this means now I have an algorithm that does the initialization, then it does step one, which takes care of the constant rules. It does step two or two prime, depending on whether the symbols I have are commutative or not. And in the end, I do three. And if in steps two or three, some constants were, were some constant rules were added, I have to iterate. And I do this until uh, no more constant rules are generated. And this is how our algorithm works. Now you could say, well, dealing with extensionality is such a minor addition. So what, what's the problem here? Well, it's a minor addition in the procedure, but it's a major uh, problem uh, if you want to show that this procedure actually is correct. So and in particular, the completeness proof gets way more involved. So you can have a look at the paper to see that. So what does completeness mean? It means if I have um, two terms that are in the congruence closure, so that they are actually equal uh, modular my theory, then I want to show that they do have the same canonical form in my rewrite system. And this is the major work in the paper to show that this actually is correct. Right, so um, I promised you to look at a situation where we have uh, commutative symbols uh, that are also extensional. So what happens actually if extensionality is applied to commutative symbols? Well, it trivializes my theory. So let's look at a situation where I have two arbitrary ground terms and I have an extensional symbol that is assumed to be also commutative. So it's in sigma C intersected with sigma E, a situation which until now we have prevented. So commutativity gives me that, of course, f of st must be equal f of ts. But then extensionality clearly gives me s equals t. So this means arbitrary ground terms are made equal, which means the theory is trivial. So it's not a useful theory. But what we can say is, well, if I want to have symbols that are commutative and extensional, I actually have to redefine extensionality. So imagine again our couples, uh, and now I have uh, unordered couples. So in that setting, an uh, unordered couple is just a set of cardinality two. Well, and now we can ask when are two sets of cardinality two equal? So I have set x1, x2 and set x, y1, y2, I want to know when are they equal, and they are equal exactly if this disjunction holds. Uh, I have to take uh, the two possible orderings, I've written things, and then I get this disjunction. So for commutative symbols, extensionality should be replaced by this C extensionality. Bad news is, if we do that, then reasoning becomes co NP complete. So if I have my E, I have commutativity for, for the symbols in sigma C, I have extensionality for the symbols in sigma E without sigma C, and I have C extensionality for the symbols that are both extensional and commutative. Then deciding the word problem becomes co NP complete. So that it becomes hard, it's no longer polynomial, shouldn't be surprising given this disjunction here. But uh, the hard work, and not very hard given what we already have, is to show that we are really in co NP if we have this situation. So let me conclude. Um, so we presented a rewriting based approach. Uh, for the word problem, uh, for finite set of ground identities, um, if we add commutativity and extensionality, but not both for the same symbol. And we've shown by a rewriting based approach 
that the complexity stays polynomial in that setting. We have also seen that if we have commutative and C extensional symbols, and actually a single one of them is sufficient to get co-MP completeness or co-MP hardness, well, then the problem gets harder. So future work. First of all, uh, here we say only polynomial. People that know results for congruence closure uh, probably ask themselves, well, what about the exact complexity? Congruence closure without extensionality can be done in n log n. We haven't looked at that in detail because, uh, well, I actually started out with not even knowing whether it's decidable. So I was very happy with the polynomiality result. But of course, it would be interesting to see whether we can also get this n log n uh, result. And I would actually conjecture we get it. Extensionality can be expressed by a kind of horn rule. And so the question would be what other properties that can be expressed by horn rules uh, can be added without destroying the polynomiality result. Other interesting question is, what about adding associative commutative symbols instead of just commutative symbols? And actually results for congruence closure have been extended to this, but uh, without extensionality. And this is something we want to look into, but it, it's probably not a trivial extension. Okay, and of course my original motivation was from description logic. So I also want to look into how we can integrate this into description logic reasoning. So this finishes uh, my talk and I'm happy to take questions. Let me just point out that both I and Deepak were supported by the respective science foundations. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. Um, so, are there questions? There is a question by Zara. So, uh, Zara, let me see, do I have to unmute? So, I gave you the permission to speak. Can, can you switch on your microphone? Um, maybe. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I wondered whether you can use the same approach that you take to commutativity also in general for equations that have finite equivalence classes say equations that permute arguments um, for higher arity. Maybe this is related to what you indicate about AC symbols. I, I mean, uh, so it's not, not so clear to me uh, how to do this in general. Um, so for, so would you subsume AC under that as well? Because I think AC is non-trivial, the extension. I see. I just thought that you can, I mean, if you collect all the constants that your term rewrites to, yeah. you could um, just consider all the equivalent terms, modulo commutativity or AC, and you get a larger set of constants, but use the same approach. Yeah, the, you there see the problem is we, we need to make this stuff uh, confluent. And in this commutative setting, I could get away without having this, this extension rules. So if you look at, at uh, say, completion uh, modulo AC and what people do there, you have to look at this extended kind of rules. Uh, and in, in the setting here with commutativity, I could get around this. So this uh -huh. is why, why directly the approach we had was uh, with the rewriting based approach wouldn't work for AC, for example. I see. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, are there further questions? So if I, if I understand correctly, extensionality is the same as injectivity, right? Yeah, yeah, but it, it sounds more application oriented. <laughs> <laughs> what would happen if you uh, require a different axiom? So if f of x1 to xn equals f of y1 to yn, then this imply. I mean, up to now you said, well, then all the arguments uh, must be yeah. equal. What happens if you just require that some of the arguments are equal, others maybe, maybe well, some of Some of them is, is trivial to handle. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's not a challenge. 
That that's not really a challenge. Uh, I just so if if you remember, I had this this uh, way we treated uh, extensionality in the in the algorithm. So yeah, so there I I add all of them and say if I would say only index one and index n. Uh, I should have something like that. I would just do it here okay. and, and otherwise nothing would change, I would claim. Okay. Um, so Christoph Ringeisen also has a question. Let me see how. So Christoph, I think you can also speak now. Yeah. C can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, my question was about uh, the, the possibility of using a superposition calculus to build uh, your term right system. Uh, I would uh, transfer this question to Deepak if it's possible, <laughs> because he has looked at, at such issues and he has actually suggested to look at this, I think, also for the AC case. Yeah, because then you could use a superposition calculus modulo AC. Yeah. In the, so in I, the... I think uh, if I can um, respond, um, I think superposition calculus uh, is like a, a sledgehammer that you are basically you know, trying to deal with a very simple problem. But in principle, the answer is yes, you can do superposition because superposition subsumes all this stuff. And but uh, but it is just uh, there's too much uh, you know baggage you have to carry with superposition. Yeah, because then you could you could encode the, the injectivity as a own close, and then you can do all kinds of things with superposition, right? Yeah, <laughs> you can introduce the. But the, the the question is, under what conditions can you get desirability? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And if I can also respond to Sarah's question, basically, if you have say two AC symbols like plus and multiplication, and you also have distributivity, then the word problem. Uh, becomes essentially same as um, you know, I, my polynomial ideal shape problem, and you have a completion algorithm which is like more like group the basis. So in general, when you int introduce permutative axioms or uh, equivalence uh, class in axioms um, on uh, constants, then um, things are going to get more complicated. But I have a paper. But some, if anybody wants to look at it, I have a paper in. Uh, General of system science and complexity, and they can be welcome to look at it, or I can also send it to people if they need. We cannot access that journal. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you very much for the nice talk.